morning and welcome to the Congregational Church of Salisbury, United Church of Christ. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome. Welcome if you are old or young or a little bit of each, believing or doubting or a little bit of each, LGBT, QIAP or straight, hungry or full, hurting or hoping. Welcome to worshipers of all colors, all genders, all relationship statuses, all states of mind, all shapes and sizes. Because you are here, the Congregational Church of Salisbury, this body of Christ, is whole and perfect. Welcome. Today, we are continuing with a series where we celebrate and recognize the season of creation, God's work in the world around us. This third Sunday in the season of creation is Wilderness Sunday, when we will see and hear in the scriptures and images on your screen and the music shared about the wildness and the mystery of the creation in which we live. I encourage you to sing out where there are opportunities to sing with this morning's introit with hymns. I encourage you to speak out where there are responsive readings and let us enter into our worship with our creation introit. Join me in reading the responsive call to worship. In the name of the Creator, the fountain of life, in the name of Christ, the pulse of life, and in the name of the Spirit, the breath of life. Amen. Holy, 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 earth is filled with God's presence. Christ, we come into your presence to worship in this sanctuary called Earth. A planet pulsating with your presence, a presence quivering in the forests, a presence vibrating in the land, a presence pulsating in the wilderness, a presence shimmering in the rivers. God, reveal yourself to us in this place and show us your face in all creation. Holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with your glory.
Please join me in reading this morning's responsive prayer of confession. In this sanctuary, set apart to give praise to God, we remember the wide and untamed sanctuary of God's creation. We remember the wild places God created, the worlds of wonder and mystery, the spirit of the wilderness. Jesus Christ, from the wilderness, hear our cry. We regret that we have become alienated from earth and have treated this garden as a beast to be tamed, as a domain to be dominated, and as a place to be ruled for our gain. We remember and confess how we have violated and polluted the wild places of our garden planet. We are sorry. We have polluted deserts with radioactive waste. We have torn holes in the ozone layer. We have desecrated sacred sites in the mountains. We have destroyed the homes of wild creatures. We have built a way of life that tears down the way of your wild creation. We are sorry. We are sorry. Christ hears our confession out of the wildness, forgives our sins against the wilderness, and calls us now to open our ears and our hearts to sustain rather than to destroy the wilderness, the world God has filled with wonder. Christ, teach us to love earth as our home and all living creatures as our kin. Help us to return home to earth. I speak for Christ. I invite you to come home to earth, and I call you to care for this planet with love, to nurture the wilderness as I have nurtured you, and to join me in healing creation. Shalom, shalom, we are coming home. As we come home to earth, Christ, have mercy. As we seek to love our home, Christ, have mercy. As we seek to care for our kin, Christ, have mercy. This morning for A Thought for Young Minds, I want to tell you the story of a boy whose name is Thronk. Now, Thronk had a friend who invited him to come to his church. And at that church, the adults all called each other brother and sister. It was Brother Fred and Sister Dorothy, Brother Charlie and Sister Lucy, Brother this and Sister that. And that Sunday night when Thronk and his parents were getting ready to say prayers before going to sleep, Thronk said, why did everybody call each other brother and sister at that church? What do you mean? asked his father. Well, all the adults called each other brother or sister something, said Thronk. Oh, you mean like brother Thronk, said his papa. Thronk had two dads. Yeah, except no one called me that, said Thronk. You know what I think, said his dad? I think they do that to show that they believe they are all part of God's family. You know, remember how we told you that when you were a baby, you grew in your mommy's tummy and you were growing because God was creating you there. So, said Thronk's papa, we are all brothers and sisters because we're all created by God. So I could call you Brother Ron instead of Papa? Well, that would mean that you were thinking about God making both of us, and that would be okay. And a long time ago, said his dad, there was a wonderful man named Francis who called the sun brother and the moon sister. 
How come? Because he was thinking about God making the sun and the moon and everything just the way God made people. Did he say, Sister Cockroach? said Thronk. Maybe he did, said Thronk's papa. But the important thing to remember is that all the people you see are brothers and sisters because God made them family just the way God made you. Thronk had to think about that. And they said a prayer together, the three of them, and I'm going to invite you to say the prayer that Thronk said with his dads. I'll say a line and you please repeat after. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for making us so many brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. And I invite you now, if you are with someone, if you are able to do it, take the hands of someone with whom you are worshiping and reach out a hand or imagine yourself reaching out a hand to others in this family of faith who are gathered in God's presence and God's word. As we say together the prayer we learned from love's own self. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in reading Psalm 18, verses 6 through 19. In my distress, I called upon the Holy One. To my God, I cried for help. From the temple, the Creator heard my voice, and my cry reached God's ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked, and the foundation also of the mountain trem mountains trembled and quaked in God's anger. Smoke went up from God's nostrils and devouring fire from the Almighty's mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth. God bowed down the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under the Creator's feet, who rode on a cherub and flew, who came swiftly upon the wings of the wind, who made darkness the covering all around, whose canopy was thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before God, there broke through the Holy One's clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. Yahweh also thundered into the heavens. The Most High uttered speech and sent out arrows and scattered them, flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O God, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, God reached down from on high and took me. God drew me out of the mighty waters. God delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They comforted me in the day of my calamity. But the, all, but the Almighty was my support. God brought me out into a broad place and delivered me because God delighted in me. A modern testimony for today is from the preface to Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey. May your trails be crooked, winding, lonesome, dangerous, leading to the most amazing view. May your mountains rise into and above the clouds. May your rivers flow without end, meandering through pastoral valleys, tinkling with bells, past temples and castles and poets' towers into a dark primeval forest where tigers belch and monkeys howl, through miasmal and mysterious swamps and down into a desert of red rock, 
blue mesas, domes and pinnacles and grottos of endless stone and down again into a deep, vast, ancient, unknown chasm where bars of sunlight blaze on a profiled cliffs, on profiled cliffs, where deer walk across the white sand beaches, where storms come and go as lightning clangs upon the high crags, where something strange and more beautiful and more full of wonder than your deepest dreams awaits for you beyond that next turning of the canyon walls. Here ends the reading. In today's reading from the letter to the church in Rome, Paul contrasts current struggle and trouble with God's hope on the verge of being revealed to us. Let us prepare ourselves for the word of God as it comes to us in the reading of Holy Scripture. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. For in hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This ends our reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Hear what the Spirit is saying to this church. Let us pray. Creator God, oil the hinges of our heart's doors that they may swing open widely and freely at your coming. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once in a while, you hear a question in church life. Where do you experience God? The question comes up in confirmation classes as young people are putting into words something about their relationship with the holy, the mystery of the ground of our being, the brightness that pales the sun and the power that spins the planets like marbles. Sometimes when we're getting to know our faith journeys, we ask, where do you experience God? Church folk may even answer that question unprompted because they know that this is one thing every pastor really should be asking, where do you experience God? Anecdotally, I can report to you that about 93 of every 100 responses will say, I most experience God in nature. In the jaw-dropping spectacle of a fine sunset, or the heavenly painting of the Milky Way, or the vastness of an unbroken horizon of ocean, or the fantastic display of northern lights, in the wondrous stillness of a lake, 
when it is calm, a mirror that doubles the beauty of the forest ringing the water. A colleague pointed out it is far more unusual for someone to say, I experience God in the middle of a church meeting that has gone on a little long. Although God is there, of course. We have a word for people who can find God in the middle of a church meeting that's gone on a little too long. We call them saints. But back to nature. Most friends who describe the awesome experience of finding God in nature tell about a natural world that is serene, sylvan, bucolic, pastoral, calming. You'll have noted that serenity was utterly absent from most of the psalm reading today. The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the mountains trembled and quaked from God's indignation. Live coals blazed. God bent the sky and descended on top of thick darkness. This is a word of God with a mission, not to enchant us with picturesque panoramas, but to reacquaint us with dangers that threaten bodily harm, earthquakes and storms that threaten life itself, the terror that threatens to undo us utterly. We are in dangerous territory here. Dangerous because attributing a destructive power, a destructive storm to God can quickly be taken up as a refrain by unscrupulous and ideologically bent preachers who declare God sent storms because of the wickedness of people. I have heard it said perhaps you have also, that God sent natural catastrophes because we have treated sinners with too much tolerance. There are preachers who claim that accepting same-sex couples, divorced folk, or non-Christians causes God to descend from heaven with fire, earthquake, and flood. Quick response, wrong. There is so much that is wrong with that kind of biblical distortion and misinterpretation, it would take a month of sermons to show how that kind of talk distorts God's life-giving word. And I wonder if that is one of the reasons we don't spend a lot of time dwelling on the awesome and frightening wildness of God because too much harm has been done already. And maybe we don't lift up God's terrible wildness for another reason, because we humans have tamed so much of the natural world Think of this, as recently as 67 years ago, the tallest mountain on earth, Everest, remained a shrouded unknown. No one confirmed as having reached the summit. Today, nearly 5,000 climbers have summited more than 8,000 times. There is something impressive about such an accomplishment. But the scripture offers us a mystery that can never be surmounted. The hint of a God who is not only as tender as a parent with a newborn child, but God who is also as terrible as untrammeled lightning, devastating as an earthquake, filled with peril as a flood, God is wildness beyond our capacity to domesticate or understand. Our tender God tends to the tenderness in us. We need that God. 
We need the same God whose wild power makes all other powers puny. Maybe you've heard the term nature deficit disorder. It describes what can happen to youngsters who grow up deprived of splashing through creeks or scrambling up rocky hills. The writer who coined the term, Richard Louvre, wrote that adults need nature as well, as a tonic, as a balancing force. The scripture reminds us that we have a real spiritual need for the wildness of the natural world as a way of experiencing not only beauty, but also the kind of awe that makes us quake with fright. Without wildness, our minds and our souls lose the sense of mystery and power. Bruce Chatwin recorded a conversation in his book, Songlines, from a mosque in Timbuktu. Row on row of gloomy mud brick arches, bat guano, wasps nests in the rafters, shafts of sunlight falling on reed mats like the beams of a burning glass. The marabou interrupted his prayers to ask me a few questions. There is a people called the Americans, he said. There is. They say they have visited the moon. They have. They are blasphemers. Here is a precious knowledge. Perhaps the holy man knew that in making our way to the moon, we have gained an astonishing mastery. But he certainly knew that without wildness and mystery beyond our reach, we cannot know God. There are practical reasons that Anyone who cares about the well-being of the planet should be angry, angry enough to rage against the ineffectual governments and rapacious industries and heedless humans who have wrought devastation on the land. Some scientists say that at least 25% of all harmful emissions since the Industrial Revolution have come from destroying wild nature. Wilderness itself is healthy and necessary for the balance of the natural world, not something just waiting to be exploited or dominated. Crying out in rage at the abuse of wilderness is also good and godly. The Bible teaches us to lament, to lament at loss, to lament at injustice, to lament at suffering. Lamenting helps to purge our spirits and our souls of the toxic buildup of woundedness. Lamenting declares out loud, when God's creatures and God's creation are abused, I am wounded. Carl Jung wrote, the foundation of all mental illness is an unwillingness to experience legitimate suffering. No sane person would seek out hurt, but sometimes we do deny or avoid or minimize our suffering, and we diminish ourselves. It's unhealthy. It cuts us off from the fullness of life. The hurt of our bodies and the hurt of the earth deserve a holy cry. And for any of us who bear the name of Christ, there are deeper reasons to lament like the prophets of old. What God created and called good is being decimated, spoiled, polluted, exploited without regard for any chance of recovery. Believing in our creator God means believing that all created things are our kin, our siblings made of the same divine essence 
as we. Knowing that the wilderness is full of dangers, knowing that humanity has damaged the wild areas of the earth, scripture calls us back to revere the wildness of God's creation, which, which hints at the utter wildness of the creator. That holy way includes time in the wilderness, the literal wilderness, beyond the sight and sound of so-called civilization. Jesus' holy way also includes time in another kind of wilderness, the wild and untamed places of ourselves, parts of our souls and psyche that are frightening in their intensity. The wildness that shakes us to our core will also make us whole. St. Paul wrote, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We groan inwardly, the groans of people who long for the joy and the wonder of union with the source of our being. We groan with awareness of our separateness from the tender and terrible God who made us. And eagerly we pray for hearts to embrace our inner wildness, which like the rest of us is made in the image of God. Eagerly we pray for the power of wildness to remain as frightening and beautiful as a desert storm out there and an impassioned love in here. So in case this is the first sermon that you have heard, and in case it is the last, remember, make space for the beautiful, terrifying, wild spirit of God. God's unruly power is in the untamed places. Protect them and revere them. God is sending us into the wilderness. Go and discover your own holy wildness. May it be so. Let us pray. O oh, holy creator, cause us to quake with awe and wonder at the utter beauty of all that you have done. Inspire us to revere and care for the work of your hands. Encourage and equip us to honor all that we do not understand. Embolden us to repair the disturbance and destruction of earth, sea, sky, and space. Empower us to face the wilderness within us and without and thus be enlarged by your presence. Give us hearts to live in harmony with you and with the creatures and creation that we shall never tame. We ask all of this in the name of love's own self, Jesus Christ. Amen. We give ourselves to the worship and the wildness of God. We give ourselves to the mission and ministry of God's church. And though we cannot be together to take up a collection of our tithes and offerings, I encourage you to continue supporting the work that we do in God's name and in Jesus' spirit. I encourage you to continue making payments on your pledges of financial support by check or by going to our church's webpage, salisburyucc.org, and clicking on the donate button. I encourage you to seize the spiritual opportunity to give from the abundance that God has given you in order that those gifts may be used for God's work. Generous creator God, you blessed the world with wilderness, 
places where your spirit of life goes untamed in a rich cycle of life and death and new life, we declare your wild creation to be truly good. In honor of the life and goodness, we make our tithes and offerings, returning to you a portion of the richness you have given us. With our gifts and with all creation, we bless our Creator.
join me in the unison prayer of dedication. God of wildness and grace, we bless these gifts in your name. May they honor you. May they bring a measure of healing to your earth. May this be a new beginning of our giving, giving the best we can offer to your gracious rule of all the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, beloved, receive this benediction. May God bless you and watch over you. May the radiance of God shine upon you and among you and within you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and grant you wholeness, harmony, justice, joy, shalom, now and evermore. Our worship concludes, our service continues. Go and delight in awe at the wildness, the mystery, the wonder of God. In Jesus' name, amen.